As a reminder, the key features of an RCT consist of randomization, allocation concealment, blinding, outcome measurement, and analysis of results. In this video, we will focus on blinding and outcome measurement. Pretend you are asked to participate in a randomized controlled trial testing a new treatment boasting to reduce pain compared to a placebo pill. You may be more likely to attribute any changes in your pain to the treatment you received if you know that you've been given the real pill. On the other hand, if you know that you've been given the placebo pill, you may be more likely to attribute any changes in your pain to natural fluctuations rather than to the intervention you receive. Your expectations of each of these treatments may influence how you report your own pain to the researchers. This means that even though randomization has been used, participant expectations may still introduce bias, making it difficult to trust the results are due to the intervention. This is where blinding comes into play. To ensure that the effects of the intervention are not impacted by the expectations of the participants, providers, or outcome assessors, blinding can occur at three levels. Participant blinding means that the treatment and comparison interventions are indistinguishable for the participants, and they do not know which one they are receiving. Provider blinding means that the treatment and the comparison intervention are indistinguishable for those providing the treatment to the participants. Outcome assessor blinding means that the individuals measuring the outcomes are unaware of which treatment the participants received. It is important to note that when self-reported outcomes, such as pain and disability, are measured using questionnaires that the participants filled out themselves, the participant is the outcome assessor. Spoiler alert, sometimes blinding is challenging, especially in RCTs of rehabilitation interventions. The potential for bias, however, can still be reduced for each level of blinding. For example, in this RCT, participants with shoulder impingement syndrome were randomized to the intervention group, which received arthroscopic acromioplasty and a supervised exercise program, or to the comparison group, which received a supervised exercise program alone. This is a clear example of when the two interventions are easily distinguished from one another by participants and by providers, like apples and oranges. Authors of this study report that the outcome assessor, a trained physiotherapist with no access to the study information or the patients, was blind to treatment allocation. However, the outcomes described in this study are self-reported outcomes. As we learned previously, when participants are asked to complete outcome questionnaires, they are then regarded as the outcome assessors of the trial. This means that since the participants could not be blinded due to the nature of the treatments being compared, there was no blinding that took place in this trial. There are ways that we can reduce bias, though. In our example, participants will know which treatment they are receiving. So to reduce bias, researchers can ask participants before they are randomized if they prefer one treatment or another. This can then be assessed and considered when interpreting the results. Alternatively, participants can be asked what their expectation is for the treatment they received and whether they think they received a credible treatment. If the expectancy or credibility is balanced between the groups, then bias can be minimized or any differences can be considered in the analysis and interpretation of results. In our example, similar to the participants, the providers will know which treatment they are delivering. So in order to reduce bias, providers can be asked if they think they are delivering the best treatment or what their treatment expectation was. Like the participants, if the expectations are balanced between groups, then bias can be minimized, or this can be considered in the analysis and interpretation of results. Providers can also be trained and provided with a script to ensure that they do not say or behave in a way that influences the patient's expectations. This helps to reduce the potential for bias in the results. Additionally, providers should be made aware of the importance of blinding so they do not inadvertently reveal to the patient which treatment they are receiving. Finally, the outcome assessors in RCTs of rehabilitation interventions are usually the participants themselves because generally self-reported outcome measures are used. Therefore, the things we talked about for reducing bias regarding the participants' treatment expectations would apply here. Now on to outcome measurement. This is the what do we want to know of the RCT. Is the treatment effective in improving function or pain? Does it effectively reduce blood pressure or the risk of heart attacks? In order to answer these questions, researchers use outcome measures. 
This may be a questionnaire that the participant fills out, or it may be something that the researcher has to measure, like blood pressure. In both cases, in order to be confident in the results, we need to ensure that the outcome measures used are valid and reliable. Valid means that the outcome measure is actually measuring what it's supposed to be measuring. Reliable means that the outcome measure can be used over and over consistently, achieving the same result. When researchers use outcome measures that are valid and reliable, we can trust that the results reported reflect actual changes in the outcome and not errors in measurement. Once we have completed these steps, we can move on to interpreting our results. Does the treatment work? Is it better than the comparison group? Is it statistically and clinically meaningful? Oh.